Okay, you can take that. You will see up there today that my the title of my sermon is If Jesus was a cricketer, he'd be a batsman. He would be a batsman. Why have I chosen that to be the title of today's sermon? It's because a batsman quite often is not on attack. A batsman needs to learn to defend, to defend well, to guard his wicket, to protect those, those, those stumps and not let the opposition at them. And quite often, a batsman is what we call on the back foot. He steps back, he puts his weight on that back foot, and that's the place of defense. He's closer to the wicket. He's more able to see the ball clearly. He's more able to discern what is about to happen, and he can guard those stumps. I've never seen a bowler bowl a ball on the back foot. Okay, he's got to have his weight on that front foot. He's got to plant that front foot to get the momentum, to get the ball to do what he wants to do. I want to say to you today that for all of Jesus' ministry, he was on the back foot. He was having to defend, 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 defend. And the questions were often asked, who are you? What's your mission? What are you about? And Jesus would very graciously defend. He would never go on attack. He would more often than not ask a question as to why they were fishing, fishing, fishing. But Jesus guarded who he was with dignity, with honor, and with a with an attitude of, that amazes me. And so it is that I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about how God, how Jesus Christ defended himself. First of all, I want to take you to a chapter in Scripture where a conversation is taking place. And quite often we can learn from the conversations that Jesus had And I want to take you to a place where I believe he was sitting with his disciples. I want to take you to Matthew chapter 24. We're not exactly sure when it was in the life of Christ that Matthew chapter 24 was written or when the events of Matthew chapter 24 took place. I'm of the opinion, as of others are, that Matthew chapter 24, the events of Matthew chapter 24, take part after Jesus has cleansed the temple for the last time. There are two temple cleansings in Scripture. One is shortly after he commences ministry, and the other is very close to the end of his ministry. And on that last occasion, he says to To the people gathered, he says, your temple has been left desolate. And so Jesus, because of the unwillingness of the people to accept Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, he says that in rejecting the temple, he himself is being rejected. And so in Matthew chapter 24, you have a picture of Jesus with his disciples, sometime shortly before his crucifixion. And as he sits with the disciples, it says that Jesus went out and departed from this temple, and his disciples came up to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And so, yeah, Jesus is in this temple setting once again. 
and he's with his disciples. And it says in verse 2 of chapter 24, And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another. That shall not be thrown down. And so Jesus now is making a prophecy. Jesus is saying this building that has ministered to the people of God, this, this building that has been a demonstration of the life of Christ is at some point going to be destroyed. Jesus was happy with that. Jesus was not concerned about that. For the temple had fulfilled its mission. It was not needed anymore. And so Jesus was comfortable in making this prophecy. And of course the disciples, they weren't too happy about it. And so when we come to verse 3, it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And so here now the disciples have had a, had a time to think about what Jesus said. And they say, okay, Jesus, if that's going to be reality, tell us when. Tell us how. Tell us what's going to happen. And when we move to verse 4, Jesus now takes a very different approach. He's taken an unexpected approach to answer the question. And in verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. And so here are the disciples, these, these, these young, strong men have been taught with Jesus for three and a half years. He's given them the wisdom and the knowledge of heaven. And the first thing he says to them to their question is, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. Not saying, I am Jesus Jesus was a common name at the time that Jesus was born. The man that was set free when they made the choice between Christ and Barabbas, his name was Jesus Barabbas. So Jesus was a common name, but Christ was not. Christ was a special name. And so he says to them, for many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. Saying what? Saying, I am the anointed one. Saying, I am the Messiah. And it would become a real issue. And in the next 30 years, before the temple is destroyed in AD 70, there is a flood of messiahs. There are many people who come to be the Old Testament fulfillment of Christ. And in doing so, it says, and they will deceive many. When we move on down and we come to verse 9, it says, Then they will deliver you up to tribu tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Verse 11. Then many false prophets will arise up and deceive many. Deception becomes the one thing that Jesus is more concerned about as he is about to depart and leave the disciples. The one thing that Jesus is concerned about more than anything else is the possibility that the disciples and the early Christian church would be deceived and deception would take over. When you come to verse 23 of the same passage, it says, 
Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. If anyone comes along and says to you that they are Christ, apart from the one who is speaking these verses, we know not to believe it. Therefore, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Yes, Jesus was very concerned that the teachings, that the, the beliefs that he had taught about himself would be eroded, would be taken away. And over the next 30 years, between AD 34 and AD 70, that becomes the main issue, the main issue of is deception. And um, we, we learn a lot from that. I want to take you now to John chapter 3. And I want you to look at a verse that we, we know well. The world knows well, but they struggle, many struggle to understand the intent of what is said in John 3.16. You all know it well, you don't even need me to read this passage of scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here is Jesus talking to a learned man, an educated man, a man of respect. And this, this, this person, Nicodemus, has become inquisitive as to who this, this holy man is as to what he's doing and, and how he's going about ministry and how it's so different than, than what was expected. And so he seeks out Jesus Christ. And Jesus is sitting there with him and he, he, he talks about God and that's not a disputed issue. The place and the privilege of God is, is not disputed. The Christ is the disputed element of it. And he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And here is Jesus very subtly saying to Nicodemus, He's given to you the Messiah. It's too early for Christ to use that language. Way too dangerous for Christ to use that language. But right here, he begins to defend his stumps. He begins this defense right here with Nicodemus. And he's starting to lay a platform that he builds on and he builds on to defend the case of Messiahship. And notice what he says here. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Notice that phrase, that he gave. The giving of God in this passage of scripture, the giving of God, the giving of God in gifting Jesus Christ to us is an historical event. This is one of the most important points that comes out of this passage that the gifting of Jesus Christ is an historical event. And I want to take you now to a couple of passages in Scripture. I want to take you to Revelation 13, verse 8. And you find throughout Scripture many of the biblical writers drawing upon the theme laid in John 3.16. Revelation 13, verse 8. The beloved disciple of Jesus catches the theme well here. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, 
whose names have not been written in the book of life will be slain. The book, whose names have been not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay? So here when Christ is mentioned, he's mentioned as an historical figure. He's mentioning as, he is mentioned as, as one that comes from the foundation of the earth. So before our world came into existence, Christ, the one that spoke, was spoken of in John 3.16, is the one that is given by God. Come over to Revelation 17, verse 8. Revelation 17, the beast that you see, that you saw, was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. And so here again, John the Beloved is, is telling us that this Christ is the one who has been there since the foundation of this world. He's not a new creation. He's a gifted being of God. And in the use of that word back in John 3.16 where it says begotten, some will use the word born. More importantly than that, it means the unique one, the unique one of God. The same language is used when you talk of Isaac. Often people think that Abraham only had one son, and that was Isaac. But Abraham also had other sons, Ishmael in particular. But Isaac is always called as the one begotten, the one begotten of God, because he was gifted to Sarah and to Abraham. In exactly the same fashion, Christ becomes the begotten one of God in that he is gifted to us. And that is what makes Christ unique and special, and the Christ, the Messiah, has to be one whose foundation, who was there before the foundation of the world. In Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, we find again a significant reference to Jesus Christ. And particularly a time element has to pass to identify the Messiah. And in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law that we might redeem, might receive the adoptions of sons. So Christ, when he sat there with Nicodemus, he says that God so loved the world that he gave. Here in Galatians 4, the giving is mentioned again. Galatians 4.4. 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth the begotten one, the unique one, the chosen one, the Christ. Very clearly mentioned to us there. Come to John chapter 17. John 17. John 17 verse 24 is where we want to go to. John 17, verse 24. Father, beautiful statement, beautiful proclamation. Christ here, as he he talks with the disciples in these very last moments, 
It's actually when he's praying for you and I, praying for the people of the world. Before he journeys to the cross, he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. What a, what a proclamation Christ is making here. He's saying, look, I was loved by God before you guys were even thought of. I was loved by the Father before the foundation of the world. There's not another one who can claim that privilege that has come to planet Earth to be with God's people, to be with God's people, more than to be with God's people, to save God's people. Come to Luke chapter 4. Here's Jesus. Interesting, the first time that Jesus had to defend himself was not after he was baptised. The first time that Jesus learns to step onto defence is when he is 12 years old. When he is being rebuked by his mum and dad for lingering in the temple, for staying with the prophets of God, for staying with the, the patriarchs of the religious faith and, and, and absorbing the things. Instead, they were angry that he had not left with them. And his parents rebuke him. And he says, hang on, mum and dad. Hang on a minute. I'm, I'm about my father's business. And so at the age of 12, Jesus learns to defend who he is and protect himself and to be quite guarded about who he is. He doesn't say any more. Nothing is said for the next 18 years that we know of. But shortly after his baptism, his parents come to him and his brothers and sisters come to him and say, look, you're demon-possessed to be doing what you're doing. You've got to be demon-possessed. Nobody in their right mind would do what you're doing. And Jesus has to defend himself against that accusation. And all the time, Jesus is defending himself. And here in Luke chapter 4, he defends himself with Scripture. It's beautiful what he does in Luke chapter 4. Starting in verse 16, it says, As his, So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as the custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the, in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Here is Jesus saying to these people, who read this book regular, who read this book often, who knew this book inside out, he, is, he says to them, today, that scripture is being fulfilled. You see it. The fulfillment of that scripture is present. And what a marvelous defense he has. I want to ask you a question. Why was the Reformation necessary. You know, we've just celebrated the 500th year of Martin Luther, of him 
bringing about the great reformation that brought us back to scripture. But why was it necessary? Why did we have to have a reformation? It's because the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 24 were fulfilled that we had to have a reformation. Because teachers, false Christ, false prophet flooded the area. From AD 70 through to 300 AD or CE, if you want me to speak the correct language. In that time period, the false doctrines, the false teachings that flood the world are, are unbelievable. They come from every quarter, every group of people bring about these happenings. And one of the main documents that, service, that, that, that surfaces at this time is a document called the Talmud. It is a Jewish document. It, is a, it becomes a central text of the rabbinic, rabbinic Judaism. There are two components to the Talmud. First, there is the Mishnah, which was written in about 200 CE. And then some two, three hundred years after that, the Jamara text was written about 500 CE. The Mishnah was the new interpretation of the Old Testament. It was a written com compendium of rabbinic Judaism's oral truth. And it is given preference over the Old Testament. It completely usurps the place of the Old Testament. And then as they come to the Jamara version of it, they start venturing into other subjects, broadening the thinking of the Hebrew Bible. And so it now becomes the authority in the world of Judaism in place of the Holy Writ of God. In 609 CE, or AD, exactly on the 22nd of December, it is said that the angel Gabriel came to Muhammad and gave him the sacred text of the Quran. And we know the place of prominence that it has been given. In 280 CE, Another man is born, a man that shapes the world perhaps as much as Christ, and that is Constantine. He is born a Roman emperor, and he's got a problem. He has to protect the Roman civilization. It is under a threat, under a huge threat. There is now two groups of religious believers there are Christians being faithful to the Sabbath, the seventh day. There are other religious believers who have now surrendered to sun worshipping and they are now worshipping on the first day of the week. And so his biggest concern, Constantine's biggest concern was the divided church. God cannot be happy with a divided church, was his main thinking. And so what does he do? He amalgamates. He merges. He molds them into one group of people. And so Constantine has a huge influence. And of course, as he merges and as he molds the doctrines of the apostles, the teachings of Christ are replaced by the teachings of man which become traditions practiced. Constantine passes away in 337 AD CE 
And some 17 years later, another man is born. Augustine is born. He's converted to the new concept of Christianity of Constantine in 384 AD and goes about building, building, building. It's as a result of his influence that the Dark Ages is introduced to the world. When the things of God have been completely suppressed and sent into exile, that the new teachings take over. And so you've got the Koran, you've got the Talmud, you've got the writings of Constantine, Augustine, you've got all of these guys, prolific writers, prolific teachers, none of them support Christ. One of the great sins of the modern church was to take Christ out of his temple. After Christ died and ascended to heaven, we're told that he was seated at the right hand of God. He was the authority of God now in heaven. You see that in Revelation chapter 5 where he is restored to the throne. But to, for any doctrine or any teaching to be effective in demoralizing Christianity and in demoralizing Christ, Christ has to be removed from his temple. And the only way that could take place was why when Augustine established a priesthood on earth to replace the heavenly priesthood of Christ. And so why was the Reformation? It was necessary because the things of God, the teachings of God, through a 300, 400 year period after the resurrection of Christ were completely changed, completely obliterated. And so it was necessary that a Reformation would come to return us to the things of God. And we praise God that Martin Luther was successful to a degree. He never achieved the objectives of God. He never went the whole way. Other people had to pick up and pick up, and so we had Lutherans, we had Baptists, we had all these different religious faiths, building, 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 restoring the things of God. But by the time we come to 1846... It stops. It stops. The building process of the, the things of God and the understanding of Christ stop. After the disappointment of 1844, people were so discouraged. Hey, God's not real. God's not, God doesn't know what he's talking about. Things didn't happen the way God said. So there's a huge falling away. And that's why the Seventh-day Adventist church is born to become the voice of God at that point in time to make sure that the teachings of God, the teaching of Christ stay on track, stay on track. Christ himself defended his stumps. Christ himself, I believe, was a better batsman than, De than Donald Bradman ever was. Christ was not out. Christ's innings went for the whole duration of his life and even his death on the cross was not an out. It was a victory. And it continues through his heavenly ministry, through his second coming. Christ is not out. He is a true defender of the teachings of God. And that's why the, the New Testament is the good news. The New Testament that we have was all written in the 35 years. Most of it was written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. Not many of the disciples that Jesus talked to in Matthew chapter 24 were around to see it. 
My research has showed that the first of the disciples to die through persecution was James, the son of Zebedee, in AD 44. That's how quick. Jesus had died in AD 31. Within 13 years, the first of the disciples is killed, is martyred for the faith. The next are both Peter and Paul. They were taken out quite early because they were in very severe opposition, very strong opposition to the new formations of doctrines that were out there. And Paul and Peter, they stand up and they say, please don't succumb to these deceptive teachings. Stay true. And so they were taken out very early, in AD 66 most probably. Andrew, AD 69. Nathaniel, maybe 69. Philip, 54. Matthias, the replacement disciple, was early AD 70. And the four that were there to witness the destruction of Jerusalem were Thaddeus, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and John the Beloved. But something interesting happened to John the Beloved. He witnessed the destruction of the temple. And he was a strong advocate in the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus. So the Romans take him. Heat up oil. Why oil? Why not water? Well, you can heat oil three times hotter than you can heat water. And so they filled this cauldron with oil. They had to shut him up because he was amongst, he was the only one amongst the chaos of all these false Christs and false prophets that were staying true to the Christ that had spoken to them in Matthew chapter 24. And so he stands as an advocate for Christ. And they've got to shut him up. So they put him in the cauldron of oil. I don't know what he looked like after that. I don't think he would have looked very nice. I'm sure he would have been badly scarred. But it didn't work. It didn't have the desired effect. So then they exile him. And it's in the midst of that exile that the God of heaven comes and gives another understanding of who? The Christ that spoke to him in Matthew 24. The same Christ. Not a different Christ. Not a new Christ. Not another Messiah. Not a different Messiah. The same one is spoken of all throughout the book of Revelation. The same Christ. And who's the Christ? The one who was slain from the foundation of the world. The one who was with God in the beginning, the one who came as a babe, the one who lived life on this earth, the one who died on the cross is the Christ, the one slain from the foundation of the world. There was one lady that understood better than anyone else, and that was the woman found in John chapter 4. She was not a Jew. She was a Samaritan. She was a Samaritan that had no privileges, had no respect, ostracized from her community, had to go to the well in the middle of the day. You don't do that in a hot place. You don't go gathering water in the middle of the day. But this woman had no dignity left. She had nothing to go and get water, she wouldn't even walk down the main street of town for she would be talked about. She would be ridiculed. She would, they would make fun of her. She would sneak out the back door and go to the well, Jacob's well. And every time she did that for most of her life, there was no one there. But on the one occasion in John chapter 4, there is a man there. There is Jesus there. 
And they enter into a conversation. John chapter 4. And of course, you, you, those of you who have read it know that it's Jesus talks about living water and those who drink of that water will never thirst. And so we have this, this beautiful story of this, this woman. We'll pick up the story in verse 11. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you go to get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? She's twigged, she's twigged that this guy is special. But the one who was most special to them was Jacob, the giver of the well to these people. The one who had brought life to a dying community. Jacob, are you greater than he is? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will, will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give them will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me the water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go, call your household and come. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have said well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband and that you spoke truth. The woman said to him, sir... I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither, when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and, and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is speaking, is seeking such to worship him. Verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who was called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Am he.